an extraordinary event is about to take place. In a quiet corner of Northern Ireland, the pain caused by terrible violence will be confronted. At Ballywalter House, victims and perpetrators prepare to meet. And coming to guide them, the world's greatest champion of truth and reconciliation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning. Archbishop Tutu will chair face-to-face -face meetings between victims and men who inflicted violence. I do not regret the fact that I was involved in the IRA. As a matter of fact, I'm very proud of it. I joined because I wanted to kill Catholics. You're out to kill. You're out to kill as many British soldiers as possible. The perpetrators will be questioned directly by the victims. I have nothing to gain by this. You, you know, said I you had four... your hand on the gun. Yes, on I the just tried the weapon. So yeah. If your hand was on the trigger, who pulled it? My husband went in to rescue people and they blew him up. Mm. Now, do you think that is fair that people do that? No. You said yourself you were out to shoot a gone man. Mm. You were angry. I was angry. You're very yes. angry. I was angry. You'd prefer revenge. Will you forgive me? Can you? With Archbishop Tutu is Donna Hicks of Harvard University. She's widely experienced in conflict situations like the Middle East, Sri Lanka, and Colombia. And Leslie Belinda. Her husband was murdered in the Rwandan genocide and she went there to try to find his killers and learn the truth about his death. But the guiding presence is a man who knows how to lead people on a journey to honesty. We expect obviously that all who come here are telling us the gospel truth. This society has endured extraordinary suffering and too often lies and silence have stood in the way of truth. With more than half the murders unsolved, many families are still waiting for answers. In this programme, none of the victims has seen anybody convicted for the attacks which brought agony to their lives. But now they have a chance to face men who belonged to the organisations they blame. These are men with a violent past but they've chosen to come here to meet these families. A widow and a survivor of the single biggest attack the army suffered at the hands of the IRA come face to face with an ex-IRA man who shot dead an SAS officer. And the family of a teenager murdered in a sectarian drive-by shooting meet a man who bludgeoned a Catholic to death. But first, a policeman maimed in this rocket attack meets a man who killed security force members for the IRA. In the explosion in 1981, Constable Michael Patterson's arms were blown off. The police officer sitting beside him that day, Constable Alexander Beck, was killed. The attackers have never been caught. Security force members were also targeted off-duty by IRA men like Tommy McChrystal. In 1979, he took part in the murders of John Graham and John Hannigan. Both were Protestants and part-time soldiers shot dead by Tommy McChrystal's IRA unit. Now the policeman maimed in the Belfast explosion by the IRA, Michael Patterson, has come to meet Tommy McChrystal. Good morning. Thank you so very much for coming. 
we were very impressed that uh, both of you have been willing to take what is a very courageous step um, to want to be to sit at the same table and to engage with one another. Michael Patterson begins by going back 25 years to the day his colleague was killed. Uh, I was on an early turn, which meant uh, I was starting duty at 7 a.m. Uh, after parading for duty, we went out on mobile patrol and I had been driving about for some time. And I think it was around about 10.30 in the morning when we were travelling up Suffolk Road in this two-vehicle patrol. So uh, the, the, I was in the, the first vehicle, sitting in the front passenger seat as the observer, and uh, around about 10.30 in the morning, uh, I was aware then of something happening. Uh, actually, I was aware of an explosion out to the left of the vehicle. My thought was immediately that it was a blast bomb and that we're okay in here. But very quickly, I realised that uh, it was more than just that because it felt pain and looked down. At that stage I was aware of my right arm severed and what had actually happened was that the rocket had been fired from uh, the right side of the vehicle. It had burnt through the driver's door, killing Alec Beck and amputating this arm above the elbow, this arm below the elbow and smashing my left leg before burning out through the passenger door and exploding outside. So our vehicle had stopped at this stage, the engine had stalled, and I looked over at Alec and knew he was dead instantly, just the, the shape that he, ha he was in. And it seemed like a long, long time before anything happened, but at some point later an ambulance crew arrived and I was taken into accident and emergency, and uh, I was aware of the clothes being cut from me, <coughs> and a lot of activity around me. And at that point I was, became more comfortable and uh, slipped away into uh, unconsciousness. The next awareness that I had was coming to that night in intensive care. I think it was about 20 past six, and my family were around me. And I was unsure whether they knew my arms were amputated. Now, it was obvious to see. I knew they were gone, but I wasn't sure that they knew. And when I woke up, I could see my left leg was in traction, and the arms were bandaged up. So. Very gingerly I tried to address the subject with uh, my wife and my mother who were there and uh, I said, were you speaking to the doctor? They said, yes we were. And what did they say about me? He said, then they said, he said you'd be, uh, you're a bit cut up but you're going to be alright. And uh, I then asked, did he say anything about my arms? And they said, well, uh, they're a bit damaged but you're going to be okay. I said, well, uh, did he say that I've lost my arms? And they said, well, he did. I said, that's okay as long as you know. Now, <laughs> it was obvious, but uh, for me, uh, I was trying to approach that very gingerly. You're trying to protect them, it Yes, uh -huh. yeah. it was. Yeah. And can, can you tell us a bit what it's like learning to live without arms on a day-to-day -day basis? What are the implications of that for you? Initially, it was extremely difficult because the things that I would have taken for granted uh, on a regular basis, then I couldn't do anymore. I couldn't use a knife and fork as I'd done before. Uh, other things as well, getting dressed is a difficulty and I would uh, tend to use uh, another hook on this side and a button hook to try and get buttons done. But I can only get them done up a certain distance and I can't tie my own tie. Uh, so I rely on others to do that. Michael, going back to that day, trying to make sense of the whole thing, do you wonder, well, was this an injury that took place in the line of duty? Or do you think this was, I was a victim of a terrorist attack? I think I would tend to see it as an injury that happened in the line of duty. I don't really see myself as a victim. Somebody. I see myself as somebody who has experienced uh, an impairment, a major impairment as a result of uh, the troubles, but to see myself as a victim puts me in a one down position I think, whereas to rise a above that and not be, feel I'm a victim allows me to get on with my life. Thank you so very much. Uh, we, 
we are very privileged to have been here to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Tommy, it's your turn. And are you able to tell us a little bit about what it was like when you grew up in Oma? Uh, well, growing up in those days, few nationalists had a vote. Uh, housing was poor. Work was very little. And we walked the streets in 67 up until 69, trying to change this system. But the response to that was the troublemakers just beat them off the streets. And this is the background that brought me to where I just said this has to stop. And by doing that, I joined the Provisional Irish Republican Army. So Tommy, when, when you decided uh, to join the IRA and you realized that it meant that you would most likely have to be, you know, have to kill people, what went through your mind at those, in those days? What went through my mind then was, we have an objective here and it's to achieve a united country. It wasn't a case of singling out any particular individual. Do you know what I mean? It was... But you did target certain people. Certain people were targeted. And tell us why they were targeted. Because they were members of the British Armed Forces. And why was John Graham targeted? I'm just curious, what, is, what was it about John Graham? Well, I was not told. You didn't know. What it was about any of these individuals. I was given an operation to carry out. Can you just take us through that and tell us what, what led up to his death? Well, I was convicted of driving the car on that particular operation. And officially that's what there was. I may have had another part in the operation as well, but because I was convicted of driving the car, that's what I'll stay with, if you understand. So you followed John Graham? You, no, you I was what? living, we, were, we went to a spot where he would be passing. Mm -hmm. And the operation was carried out from there. Unfortunately, Mr. Graham lost his life. Did uh, you see him before you killed him? To be quite honest, no. The, uh, he, he was in a, a milk lorry and he seemed to have a reinforced door on the lorry. The armalite rounds were just breaking off the door like powder. At some stage, Mr. Graham got out of the lorry with uh, a rifle in his hand, or what looked like a rifle. And at that stage, those that were involved in the operation felt it was time to withdraw, you know what I mean? And they were in the process of doing that. Did he fire at that point? I don't think, uh, to be quite honest with you, I can't remember. Mm. You know, because everything reacted so quick. It was fire and started. Somebody had to run and get the car. I think it was me. So I don't. Did, did you fire shots on that day? Yes. Mm. I did. Now, whether I fired the shots that actually killed Mr. Graham or not, it's hard to know because there's few people there. That's all I'm prepared to say on that, mm -hmm. you know. When did you know that it was this John Graham? I, uh, I learned about 
was eight, eight, about eight or ten hours later. So when you did discover who it was, yes. what sort of, and, and that he had been killed? Well, what I was saddened, through your mind then? in a way, I was saddened for, for, for him because and his family. Did you know he had family? Yes, children? I actually knew the man. But on that particular day, I didn't know that that was the man. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's, you see, this is... And I'd known him for a long time. I'd, I'd known him as I was growing up. And I felt awful sorry for his family. I'm conscious, Tommy, that we've talked quite a bit about John Graham. Uh, but there was another man, John Hannigan, and That's I just correct. wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the circumstances surrounding his death. It was the same situation. Uh, called the house and told I was going on an operation. On that particular one, I was the driver. And I didn't, as a driver, I wasn't informed as to who the target was and, uh, and then I learned the next news and I also knew him very well. I played in the street in front of his house and I knew that he had kids and it was thinking of him, thinking of his family and then it widened out. You know what I mean? There's an awful lot of families that went through the whole process and that stage I was beginning to have the doubts as to the validity of the armed struggle as it was going. Because what I felt then was we're filling the prisons, we're filling the graveyards, And we're not beating them, and they're not beating us. So it had to be an alternative. And it was that we had to find a point where we could all agree on and move forward then. We're not at it yet, but hopefully we'll get there. M Michael, Tommy has said that he experienced doubt i um, wondering what it would be like for you if you heard someone who was responsible for your injuries say that he had doubts. Uh, if somebody was involved in my incident uh, and expressed doubt as to uh, their, their actions, I think I would accept that just as that's okay. That's where they are and I'm able to move on because it doesn't bring Alec Beck back, and it doesn't bring back my arms. Exactly. And, but if that's where they are in their healing process, that's okay. That's how we're going to achieve maybe something here. More people thinking like that. You know what I mean? That's maybe how we are going to achieve something. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Can you tell us, Michael, a little bit about what difference it's made to you where you're at now, to have been able to sit with Tommy, to hear where he's coming from. Uh, I'm glad that Tommy was so open uh, about his experiences, what motivated him to, to become involved in the IRA. And I get a sense that what you're saying, Tommy, is that the state should accept responsibility for what it's done. And similarly, individuals who've been involved in activities should accept responsibility yes. for what they have done. And I know you spoke uh, totally candidly about uh, what your involvement in the various incidents. And with you taking that responsibility, saying I had uh, a particular role, I'm wondering how it impacts on you emotionally, given the fact that you knew both people who were yes. killed. It, it makes me look back an awful lot. And it makes me now realise that it's time that didn't happen anymore. And we're, we're partly there, we're not fully there yet. And my big fear is that somebody's going to throw a spanner in the works here. 
and in 15, 20 years' time, down the line, there's going to be some young fella sitting in the same situation I was sitting in, and in the same situation you were sitting in, on opposing sides, and ending up the way we ended up. Mm. I agree with that. You know. Mm. Tommy, what was it like for you, sitting here this morning, looking at Michael, hearing him tell his story? I was greatly impressed by Michael. In fact, I was astounded by Michael. I never thought I'd see the day, to be quite honest with you, that I would have sat down with a member of the RUC to discuss anything. But listening to you and listening to what you've come through, and listening to where you've arrived at greatly impressed me. I was expecting a certain amount of hatred, even under the table. So it was. But I didn't sense it, I didn't feel it. I didn't know what way I would react. I was a wee bit weary of myself that maybe somewhere along the line the mask would slip and eventually the horns would come out on me again. Now, that didn't happen and it hasn't happened. And I think you've helped, to be quite honest with me. I don't know. I mean, how do you want to, to close this session as two persons? How do you want to close this session? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be happy to shake your hand, Holly. All the best. See it yourself. Thank you, Eli. This is marvellous. And, and somehow we, we hope, I mean, that, uh, that you could be some of the most powerful instruments for God to make God's world a far better place than it is. God bless you. While there is peace of a kind now in Northern Ireland, violence has continued to blight people's lives. In 2001, a Belfast teenager was murdered by loyalists in a drive-by shooting. The attack was sectarian. The gunmen have never been caught. Gavin Brett, a Protestant, was murdered because his killers from the Loyalist Ulster Defence Association, the UDA, believed he was Catholic. He was 18 when he was shot. Gavin was the child of a mixed marriage, a fun-loving boy with friends from both communities. 21 years separated his murder from that of Alex Reed, but both were killed by the UDA. Alex, a Catholic, was kidnapped on his way home. He was beaten to death here by a 17-year-old wielding a concrete block. The killer was a UDA member, Alex Calderwood. Now out of jail, he's agreed to meet the family of that other UDA victim, Gavin Brett. Thank you so very, very much for, for coming. It is a magnanimous step, uh, which we hope uh, is going to be something that contributes to the healing of, of this country. And we hope that for yourselves too, uh, what you are doing here today may begin the process of of your own healing. So, Michael, yes? What, what was Kevin like? A 
I'm hoping to have a colleague sitting here, Mr. Cotterwood, with you. Um, Gavin was very popular, had many, many friends. Um, he had his whole life in front of him. And he was a very much loved son. But it's not just the loss of Gavin, it's um, his future. Yeah. You know, um, the wife he could have had, the children he could have had. Mm. Would you take us back to the day that Gavin was shot. Can you tell us what happened, what, how your day went? A lovely summer's night and we had the window in the living room open and he came around the back of the house and he sort of stuck his head through the window and you know this sort of business and uh, came in and he spoke and he said I'm way out, see you later. And uh, the next thing, uh, the phone rang, and I answered the phone. And uh, a male voice said, is that the breath? And I said, yes. And he said, uh, you better come round to the front of the estate. Your son's been shot. And uh, Michael, well, you took over really from there. My first reaction was one of anger and shock, obviously, but the anger I was sort of going through my mind as a race drain to the front of the front of the state where he was shot. But however, uh, you don't know what you're thinking, really. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I raved around the scene and Jesus was awful, you know. So what did you do? Sorry. After Michael, can you? At what point was Phyllis? Right. With you, with, were you? It was. It was quite a while. Um, quite a long space of time passed, and um, then the police came and uh, said, "You want to see him?" And I went round, and it was just lying there on the ground. Mm. And all you could see was his foot and this awful sheet over him, and it was just disgusting. So I, well, how about, you know, at my son, who an hour before I've been carrying on, was lying on this dirty ground, mm. and that somebody had killed him. And it was just, it wasn't real. So, um, wasn't real. Nightmare falls. And then, um, we all went back to the house and the police sort of did whatever they had to do. And then they came back and said, we're taking him away. And so we went back round and kissed him. And I went back to the house and Everyone was just, the house was full. And what have you found has been helpful for you to bear it and to give you strength to, to keep going day by day? I find my wife a tower of support. Mm. There's times that I couldn't cope with her. And that's my support. If I feel uh, maybe I'd love to be able to speak about Gavin. I'd love to be able to put Gavin's words in my mouth and say, why, you know, why do these things occur? You know, um, a lot of. Uh, a lot of silent voices now. 
probably saying the same thing, you know. It's all wrong, every bit of it. Thank you. I believe you are going to be able to have touched many who are hurting and maybe help tears that are locked away to flow. Thank you. I like Okay. Suppose I may start at the beginning. I was born in a wee place called Brown Square at the bottom of Shangle Road. And I, I have to be truthful and say, although <coughs> I didn't like it, but I grew up as a young boy, as a bigot, hating people from the Catholic community, because my perception at that particular time was that all Catholics were in the IRA. At 16 years of age, I looked around at all the rest of my mates, and at that particular time when you joined the UDA, they used to give you a wee blue jacket with a fur collar on it, and that was your sort of sense of identity with the big boys, and at 16 years of age, I then joined the Loyalist Paramilitaries. I suppose I wanted, I didn't want to be the oddball, I didn't want to be the odd one out. So I wanted to join the Paramilitaries because I wanted to be the same as everybody else. And I joined because I wanted to kill Catholics. And I don't make no bones about that. I was 17 and a half years of age. I've been drinking heavily, drinking with all the mates, go to a Loyalist club in the Shankle, different clubs where you go, have a drink. <coughs> on one particular evening, I left to go home and I came across, across a group of men who were holding two Roman Catholics up against the wall. And one of the guys turned around and said to me, my nickname at that time was Ozo. He says, Ozo, have you got a gun? I says, no, I don't, but I can get one. As he said that, one of the Catholic guys actually ran away. I sent the rest of the men that was there. I told them to go after the other one. I took the other, the other young fella and I took him away. I set myself up as judge, jury and executioner and I took that young man's life. I like. Um, when you came across the group that was holding the two, the two men, were you able to see their facial expressions, the, the, the two Roman Catholics? I was, I was able to see their expressions, but at the end of the day, the only way that I was thinking is, as a Protestant, if I had went into a Catholic area, I believe that they would have done exactly the same thing to me, mm. what I had done to the person, what I had done when I took that young man's life. So, um, you started, you started killing this man. Yeah. Did he look at you? Well, he did look at me, and he did, he did confirm that he was a Catholic, so that was good enough for me. You asked him? I did, yeah. And he said? He just said he was a Catholic, yeah. And obviously I didn't, wanna, I didn't really want to be concerned whether he was a member of a Republican movement or whatever. To me, that was good enough was good for that enough. man to lose his life, yeah. And did you know he was dead? I knew he was dead when I left the scene, yeah. How? Because I knew what I'd done to him. You hit him on the head? I did, yeah. But, as I said, at that particular time, I knew exactly what I was doing, I knew what I wanted to do. And I knew that that person was dead before I left. <coughs> I don't think we really need to go into details about how I was killed or... Does anything haunt you today? <sighs> Not now, no. When I was 25 years of age, I made a conscious decision. I was in prison and I said that I wanted to learn to read and write because I couldn't read and write. So I approached the governor and asked the governor would he get me a remedial teacher. So when I started the process of learning to read and write, then I started reading books. Then I started to realise for the first time in my life that not all Catholics were in the IRA. But that was a long, hard process in a sense because then I'd realised that I'd taken someone's life I'd realised the implications about family, about someone having a brother or a sister, a mother, a father. That's why I'd made my decisions to move on. And, and I've been involved in quite a lot 
from I've come out of prison. Mm -hmm. I've helped a lot of people and I will continue to do that for as long as I can. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anything that you might perhaps want to ask? I cannot for life of me. Uh, understand your reasoning for uh, killing some murder on Sunday. I can't. I think my reasoning at that particular time was sectarianism. I hated Catholics no, because that's the way it was brought up. But he's saying he can't understand no, that maybe... That's fine. Could, mm -hmm. you, you come across to me, maybe I'm wrong, as, you know, very complacent, um, but your community had a lot to do with what happened to you. From an early age going to school, um, I was thumped, attacked, robbed by Catholics going to school. But I find it very difficult to get my head around what I could only describe as the hatred that you felt, you know, um, that you could take a life. Um, that happened. My husband here, he came from the falls, so he would have probably been indoctored in the same way as you would, only from the opposite side. But it's we both managed to overcome, you know, where we came from, end up together. Um, well, that's a very good point, but what I'm saying is everybody grows up in a different area. If you look at the, you look at the Shangle Road and look at the, the amount of prisoners that went into prison from the Shangle, yeah, well, it's phenomenal. When you look at the rest of Northern Ireland, in the Shangle Estate itself, out of maybe 3,000 people of a population, I would say that the whole 3,000 people in the Shangle Estate have been affected. Yeah, I mean, my, my, mother, my mother is a Shankill Road woman, um, born and bred. But <sighs> well, I can assure you from my own perspective that I am very deeply sorry for the hurt that I caused anyone in, in my time and growing up, and that I do apologise if I have come across as complacent, because I certainly didn't mean to do that. Can I just say something? You say that you joined the paramilitary because you didn't want to be an odd one out, but would it not be better to be odd one out than be a killer? Well, I would have been more courageous to do that, but unfortunately I didn't have the backbone to do that at that particular time. Okay. If I'd have grew up in certain places on the falls, I probably would have joined the IRI. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, mm -hmm. that's why I brought up. I think that's, that's important. Mm. Would you, would you portray yourself as a victim? I don't want to say yes. I could turn around and that, that's the reason when I came here I didn't come to try and justify anything that I'd done. And I'm not going to try and do that because what I'd done was very, very wrong. I'm probably a victim of circumstances which led me to get involved, but I'm not a victim, no. I'm responsible for what I'd done and I'm sorry for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think to, to say um, that you realise what you've done was wrong and that you are sorry for that is a big start. Thank you. What, what do you feel, Alec, listening to I this just, family? I feel humbled for the experience that I've received today and I'll take it away with me for the rest of my life. I won't forget okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. How are you going to say goodbye to each other? I'll, uh, I acknowledge the gentleman sitting here in front of me. You know, he's uh, our fourth rate and his uh, combination of violence now. And uh, you've read your. your your mother, you, you done. So, the way forward, no one is everybody, Catholic, Protestant. And that's all I hope to do. Forward. The way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I just feel so deeply humbled mm. to be in the presence of people such as yourselves. 
And I think, I think it is something beautiful that I hope you, you will be able to take out from here and plant a seed and, and, let, and let a seed grow. God bless you. On the same day Lord Mountbatten was murdered, the IRA also launched its deadliest attack on the army, killing 18 soldiers in a double bomb explosion at narrow water near Warren Point. But the families who lost loved ones and the men who were injured that day have never seen the bombers convicted. The first bomb killed six soldiers in a convoy. The second killed 12 more, among the many who'd gone to help wounded comrades. One of those who lost his life in the second explosion was Sergeant Major Walter Beard. He was married to Josette and had two young daughters. Others were badly wounded in the attack, like paratrooper Tom Cahi, who suffered serious leg injuries. One year later, the IRA killed SAS Captain Herbert Westmacott in Belfast. He was the highest ranking member of the regiment to die in the conflict. IRA man Joe Doherty was convicted of his murder. He was released from prison under the Good Friday Agreement. Although Joe Doherty did not kill Josette's husband Walter, who died at Warren Point, she and her daughter Verony want to question someone from the organisation responsible. They've come with Warren Point survivor Tom Cahey and Graham Eve, a fellow paratrooper, to meet the former IRA man, Joe Doherty. We are very impressed, we are, we are very humbled too uh, uh, that you would want to come to what is essentially an informal forum. We hope a safe space uh, in which you will, we hope, engage in a dialogue. So, Josette, please. Okay. Um, well, 26 years ago, I was a very happily married woman with two lovely young children, um, Beverly and Claire. Beverly's with me here today. And um, um, then there was, I had a very loving husband who was devoted to them, who would do anything for them, and basically, when he came home, would take them off my hands and say, they're mine now. And then all that was blown to pieces by a bomb at Warren Point, and uh, I was left devastated for many years. Can you tell us about that? Um, I heard about the explosions. I think the first one was about five o'clock. I heard there had been an explosion at uh, Warren Point. And I thought, oh, God, well, no, we'll be fine. And then um, it was a bit later, and they said there'd been another explosion. And obviously my husband was killed in the second explosion, so he was, a re um, he was going in to help people and then he was blown to pieces, which to me is the worst part of the fact that rescuers were blown to pieces and I just felt that was so abysmal. Mm. But then I phoned at seven o'clock and said, could I speak to Wally? And they said, oh, no, you can't, but he's fine. Well, obviously he wasn't fine. He'd been dead then for, well, at least an hour. And... Um, and then uh, I saw a car come into the close where I lived and one of my Walter's best friends, Jerry Davis, got out of the car and said, Josette, put your arms around me. And I said, no, 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 this isn't happening. Um, and then obviously, first thing I said, I want to see him. And they said, um, no, you don't want to see him. I said, yes, I do. I want to see Walter. I want to see his body. And they 
it, then it, things got very confused because no one actually came to me with the truth of what had actually happened to Walter on that day. And then it wasn't until two years later that I received the real death certificate and it said this integration of the body. Mm. And I was absolutely devastated two years down the line to think that we hadn't buried Walter where we thought we'd buried him. He wasn't been there at all. Can I perhaps ask you how, over the years, you have thought and felt towards the men who killed your husband? Um, I wanted them dead, to be honest. And then I found that one of them did blow himself up anyway, um, in a van, I believe, wasn't it? Yeah, he, burned, he, he blew himself up. And I was, I was really pleased. Thank you so much for the moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Tom? Well, <clears throat> I was a 16 year old boy. Uh, my father was ex Parsha Regiment. <clears throat> I was born in Northern Ireland. My ambition was always to join the Parsha Regiment because, foolishly enough, I wanted to jump out of aeroplanes. And that's what I went and done. And the night before Warren Point, I was actually at my mother's house with three friends on a long weekend. We got the phone call to come back on the Monday, so we were going down a day early. Uh, on route to Newry, we were blown up. I was in the first explosion. Uh, quite easy. It wasn't painful, wasn't hurtful. Rumble, flash of lightning, so look that, sensation of flying. Uh, sat up, I was on fire, I looked around me, there was carnage everywhere, couldn't hear anybody, couldn't see anybody. Uh, the day was really hot, it was a lovely sunny day, and I asked for something to cover my face, because my, my face was stingy, mm -hmm. and I was lying with a red berry over my, my face, uh, just lying there, basically waiting. And I could hear a voice in the background going, dead, 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 dead. And this voice was getting closer to me. And I was like, dead, dead. And it was all right. And it was above, it was at the back of my head. And I was like, dead. And I went, I'm not. I'm alive. You know, and that voice sticks in my, my mind. So... Um, can, I, can I ask you a question about what it's like now? To what extent do you feel that it's still affecting you today? It's so very hard. Can you tell us about that? Uh, how do you explain hurt? Uh, guilt. I feel guilty because I'm sitting here. Mm. You know, and that's, that's what it is. Because you survived. Yeah. I had swapped seats 10 minutes before the, the initial explosion. You know, that's why. When I was younger, uh, I was on a death wish. I was in, I was self destructful You know, didn't want to live because it was easy. I'd experienced how easy it is to die, and it wasn't painful. The painful bit was surviving. Thank you so very much uh, for your contribution, which I, I would hope is something that will make people sit up and take notice. Thank you. Joe. My name's Joe, you can refer to me as Joe, and thanks very much for being here. I'm sure it took a lot of courage for you to be here. Um, I was born in 1955, and um, as a young boy I experienced, here's civil rights people, also for basic civil rights within society and being put down. And when you were growing up, you were, you were, awake, you were being awakened, say, half four in the morning with Army uh, Saracen, armoured cars were coming in, they would kick down towards people who were being arrested and taken into military complexes to be questioned and interrogated. I grew up with that 
waking it up. The very first time we were hit, I was 15 years of age, and I shouted at the my dad. Dad, they're all outside, and bang, 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 the rifle butts came in. Uh, I was with my sisters, and we were all sat down in the, uh, in, in the kitchen, with our hands above our heads, something out there, frightened. The, they went in to see my mother. My mother was very embarrassed because she, she only had a wee gown on, but she never... You know, she asked the soldiers, look, could you please get outside and stay at four soldiers? And the sergeant walked in and cocked his pistol, said, you Irish bitch, get out of the bed. Uh, I'm 15 years of age, hearing my mother screaming and shouting. And that's, that's the experience I went through. That's when I went out the next day and I picked up a rock. I know it's difficult for you to understand. Why would anybody join the IRA? Why would anybody want to kill? Why would anybody want to, uh, you know, take the life of someone? My son was over to protect you. But that's the conditions where I grew up. And I grew up in a society that was different. It wasn't a, 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 it wasn't a normal society. Joe, no. yeah, let, me, let me ask you um, about the killing part. Because clearly part of becoming an IRA member was that you had to make a personal decision yeah. to take, take another life. man's life. Yeah. So tell us what happens when you pull that trigger. When you pull Explain that trigger, it. you're out to kill. You're out to kill as many British soldiers as, as possible. And I was politically very, very conscious that the more British soldiers we kill, the more bombs we kill, will force the British government and, and to negotiations. And I remember when the 18 Paris was killed, I was in prison, and I'm sorry to say it, we all cheered it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not proud of that. You know, when you're looking back and it was your husband, it was your father, I know you're probably disgusted at people, but we really thought, what a great operation. I mean, this is really going to put, 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 put the British government on, on, a, on a footing for peace. They had there. So it wasn't as if, I mean, I didn't, I didn't shoot these British soldiers because I hated these people. I didn't hate them on a personal, because I didn't know them. Mm. You know, what they are, they represented the British state, they represented the occupation of my country, they represented everything that was wrong here. Would you have, have participated in, in Little Water? Yes. You would? If, if I was in that unit <coughs> and they told me where there's an ambush tomorrow, or somewhere, someplace called Narrowater, I would have been sitting there with a plunger and I, I I don't make any apology from that there. In relation to those days, I probably would have been involved in that. Where you are now? Different. different. You, you are different. And I mean, when you look across and you see a daughter and you see, yeah. and you see a wife, uh, yeah. how do you feel about the choice you made of opting for violence? Are you remorseful, regretful of that? No. I don't have any remorse or even, I'm very concerned about this re re remorse because it means guilt, it means that I was guilty of something. Um, regret. Regret and regretting that, not just about the death of that soldier who was killed, I mean I regret everything that happened, regret that that the civil rights movement was put down, I regret that the government didn't was, was more open to change. And of course, on a personal level, I regret that that soldier had, had died. Herbert, Herbert should be with his kids now. But not in the sense of any shame, not in the sense of any remorse or any guilt. You know, but of course, on, 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 a, on a human level, being a Christian, I'm sorry that he died. You, I mean, when you, when you speak of uh, not feeling guilty uh, about, about uh, l taking life, uh, I mean, when you go up to Mass, are you able to say to God, this is okay? No, you can't do that. Um, in a moral sense, yes, the killing was wrong. In the true sense of, of morality, taking up any life, whether it's the life of an IRA volunteer when killed by the British or by the British soldiers. Thank you very much. Josette, who do you want to? Um, the first question I'd really like to ask you is, um, you say you applauded 
and I understand why you applauded, yeah. I understand that. But what I didn't understand was, it's the first time they'd ever done it, they actually, my husband went in to rescue people and they blew him up. Yeah. Now, do you think that it's fair that people do that? No. And would you condemn that? That's, that's difficult to say. It's very hard for me because, as I've explained before, I was a byproduct of a system that had put me in that position. Mm. I'm sure if I had been on that day and I seen the second helicopter come in, I'm more likely I would have let that bomb go. Tom, how about you? Do you want to ask Joe, a I keep hearing you saying civil rights. Would you condemn the civil rights that you took away? The IRA, not you personally, took away from your own commun community by abducting, kidnapping, shooting, burying, and not giving the body back. Now, you blame the British government, or the British whatever, you've done that on your own community. Yes, I know. Where are their civil rights? I agree 100%, and that's why I keep, <coughs> keep you condemn the fact it? that there's a shared responsibility. No, we were responsible. Would, would you condemn it? Um, what the IRA done to their own community that they were protecting. I condemn all violence. It's not about just saying about the IRA. If we want, I condemn all violence. I mean, I am not going to put you in the position, Tom, saying, will you condemn the killing of 14 innocent people in Derry? Will you condemn uh, the, the, the killing of all other civilians by the state? I wouldn't put you in the position. I, I want to learn from you, and I want to get put you or let you move into a, a, a situation where you'll have an understanding of what the British state represented to the community where I was born into. Right. Well, I was, was born in, in. I was born in the same country. Yes, and you course, kept, yeah. So w what is the difference between you apart from morals? Honestly? It, was, it was unique cir circumstances where I grew up. But we indeed were victims of this state. And being victims of this state, we responded by using violence. But I'm sure that what you are longing for is to be saying, yes, we, we've had this history, but what happens to our children? Yes. Uh, now, what do you want to happen for your children? What we lack, I'm not talking about everybody in Northern Ireland, is tolerance. Mm -hmm. I don't, and that is it. If we, I could tolerate your views, discuss it with you, and say, well, Joe, I don't think you're right there, but you could be. Mm -hmm. And you could say the same to me, you know. Mm -hmm. We've got to tolerate each other. Yeah. A week into it, people who were attracted, affected by the conflict, this woman here had the courage, her husband had died, and her daughter, her father had died, at the hands of the IRA, and here they are sitting with a former member. That's a great start. Well, thank you very much. We hope that what you have exposed yourselves to, coming here and opening wounds, will be a contribution for the healing of this land. God bless you. Tomorrow on Facing the Truth, I conspired to uh, assassinate these individuals. One of the two was a Mr. Dermot Haggard. <laughs> you destroyed me, girls, my home. Morally, I'm as responsible for her husband's death as anyone else. <laughs>